broadcasting from the Milstein Hall of Ocean Life at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. That's the one with the big blue whale hanging from the ceiling. And besides the oceans, one of the main themes of the museum is human origins. Where did, where did we all come from? And it may not be what you think. For example, did you know that Homo sapiens, you and me, first appeared on Earth about 200,000 years ago? Those early humans would have looked almost exactly like us, but they didn't act fully human at that time or think like we do, and even though we are and we were and are the same species. So what happened? What is it that clicked to make us the language-speaking, artistic, world-dominating species we are today? My next guest talks about our beginnings in his new book, Masters of the Planet, The Search for Our Human Origins. Ian Tattersall is also curator of the Spitzer Hall of Human Origins here at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Welcome back to Science Friday. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Tell us, you know, tell us why I was really shocked that we are still the same Homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. Well, how does, how does that work? Well, species normally have uh, quite a, a substantial longevity. I mean, 200,000 years is not a long time for a species to be in existence. But the earliest evidence we have of people who look just like us uh, comes from sites in Africa that date to about 200,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so what does it mean that they were not fully human like we would think of today? Interestingly enough, the archaeological record that goes along with these early uh, fossils that we uh, can recognize as Homo sapiens um, is pretty much the same as uh, the fossil record that was left by, or the, the archaeological record that was left by their contemporaries. 200,000 years ago, there were several different kinds of hominid in the world. And in fact, there had been several different kinds of hominid living simultaneously in the world, really all the way back to the very beginning of the human family, something like seven million years ago. So there were a whole bunch of different folks living then. And, there were indeed, yeah. And because we kind of think of a linear progression, but that's not how it mm -hmm. happened. No, in fact, the, uh, the human family tree, it turns out, has been very, very bushy. Every couple of years, I've had to redo my family tree of the human uh, uh, group, and um, I think well, I'm up to 23 species now that most people would agree are, are, are recognizable. And three or four of them at least have been in, in, in simultaneous occupation in the world at any one time. And so why did one succeed while the other 22 did not? I think it has to do with the fact that at some point in its existence, Homo sapiens became an insuperable uh, uh, competitor. It became very intolerant of uh, of competition and able to sort of enforce that intolerance. And that involved a major behavioral change. And I think it was a change basically in cognition, a change in the way in which uh, human beings uh, uh, processed information about the world in their minds. Mm -hmm. And what was it? What was the, what was the advantage that they got? Was I think it a brain, a brain change different or what happened? It wasn't simply a matter of brain size. Um, uh, 30,000 years ago, there were Neanderthals still existing in the world, a separate species of, uh, of, uh, of human that came into existence about the same time as Homo sapiens, but separately, we, are, uh, we evolved in Africa, the Neanderthals evolved um, in Europe, and they had brains just as big as ours. Mm -hmm. But they didn't behave in the same way that we behave today, and they behave more like the early uh, Homo sapiens uh, uh, that we find uh, in Africa. Mm. How, and, do you, how do you figure out how um, a human who lived 150,000 years ago mm -hmm. thought or behaved? What, what, what are the tools or what do you find? or How do you know that? Well, that's the key question, of course. And all we have uh, to judge from, if we can't judge from raw brain size, what we can judge from is the, the archaeological leavings of these early hominids, the, the uh, material evidence they left of their behavior, which is mostly in the form of, uh, of stone artifacts and of uh, uh, campsites and so forth, which give us some idea of the complexity of what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And the Neanderthals were great stone craftsmen, no question about it, but they were, they, they, they were kind of stereotyped in the way in which they, they made tools. They didn't make tools with a kind of creativity and the inventiveness there was characteristics of, uh, of the, uh, the human beings um, who came along uh, later. 
Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we've heard so many times that, you know, if a, if a Neanderthal were next to you on the subway, you wouldn't mm -hmm. know the difference. Is that, is that true or is that folk? To, Urban any, to an extent, I think um, I, I would uh, recognize a Neanderthal if it was next to me. Um, <laughs> and you have every subway. day on this. <laughs> right. But you know, we have considerable uh, experience here in making, in, in, in making reconstructions of ancient hominids, uh, uh, reconstructing how they looked in life mm -hmm. in these, um, uh, these ancient hominids. And it's very true that when you sculpt a face onto a skull, you layer on the, uh, the the, the, uh, the underlying tissues, the, the muscles and so forth, and then the superficial tissues, and you've got this bald creature you know, with no, no hair on its head or on its face um, that looks very distinctive. It looks very, very different from Homo sapiens. Then when you put the wig on, it's much harder to tell, to tell part. So that, um, in fact, uh, we... Uh, we can, we can make this kind of, uh, of reconstruction uh, and um, show it in a way in which it stands out from the rest. But if it's sat next to you on the subway, you might not have uh, too much of an, a notion. Hmm. If you'd like to ask a question, you can step up to the microphones we have there. We'd be very happy to talk with Ian Tattersall, whose uh, new book is Masters of the Planet, The Search for Our Human mm -hmm. Origins. And on the cover, you, you show three different hands. Mm -hmm. What are you trying to illustrate with that three different yeah. Well, the cover came as a bit of a surprise uh, to me, uh, as, a ma as a matter of fact. I hate it fact. when that happens. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's a very dramatic uh, cover. In fact, what it shows is the hand of, um, I think, a gibbon or a siamang, uh, the hand of a chimpanzee and the hand of uh, uh, um, a modern human. And you can see the hand proportions are very different. Mm -hmm. And what you have there is, is two higher primates, two, uh, two, 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 two apes, um, with very long slender hands that are very good for grasping branches in the trees. And you notice that our own hand is much, much shorter. In fact, it's much broader. The axis of the hand is across rather than along. And uh, that is uh, what makes it possible for us to manipulate items in the precise way in which we can do and make those stone tools that our uh, predecessors made. Uh, yes, we have a question in the audience, sir. Yes, please step up. All right, hello. Um, while I was uh, waiting to enter the recording today, I was actually reading an article in the New York Times about something that I believe was just published today or yesterday in the journal Nature, mm -hmm. that a uh, cousin, I suppose you would say, of Lucy, that's right downstairs, was mm -hmm. discovered in <laughs> Ethiopia. So my question is, I guess the big difference was that Lucy, much like us, has relatively flat feet, whereas this cousin, which seems to have mm -hmm. died out, had the sort of opposable big toe, I guess you would say. And maybe this is not very sophisticated on my part, but if opposable thumbs have been so good to mm -hmm. us, opposable big toes seem like they'd be really useful too. <laughs> So why did uh, mm -hmm. flat feet win out, I guess would be my no. main question. Thank you. Oh, well, uh, opposable uh, uh, big toes really are very useful uh, depending on what you want to do with them. Um, I, I, I saw a wonderful movie once of an orangutan uh, uh, striking a match using his, using his feet, something that, that I would have extreme difficulty uh, doing. Um, so if you want to grasp, and if you're moving around on, an, uh, on, on a substrate like you have in the trees and you have limbs to be, to, to be grasped, that's what you want to have. But as soon as you're striding around on the ground, the uh, big toe starts getting in the way. The, the, the uh, divergent uh, great toe starts getting in the way. And um, this is a very interesting report. Uh, it's as new to me as it is to you uh, that just appeared in um, in, in nature today. But we were already, I think, getting an impression that at three and a half million years ago, which is the, uh, the, the, the time that this uh, new foot from uh, uh, a site called uh, uh, Waranso in um, Ethiopia is, is from, there was already apparently some, some variation in the uh, actual structure of the feet of the various uh, hominids that were around at the time. And this new find certainly expands this, this variation in a, a very dramatic way.
This is sort of what you were saying before about the sorting out of the tree. In other words, mm -hmm. there's different kinds of creatures living all at the same time. Some with flat feet, some with opposable toes. Well, apparently so. If this, uh, if this report is to be taken at, yeah. uh, at, 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 at face value, and they don't have a complete foot, but I think they have fairly good uh, um, uh, evidence on which to base this, uh, this reconstruction of the divergent toe. And yeah, apparently there was a, a hominoid you know, right. around at, uh, at, at, at that time in that environment uh, with uh, this divergent toe. And yeah, it's adding to the complexity of the picture. Uh, when, I was, uh, when I was learning this field uh, too many decades ago, um, we were all taught that it was basically a linear picture, that, that uh, the human, human history was a sort of a, a linear, dogged struggle from primitiveness to, to perfection. And we're learning that this really wasn't the case and that we are the product of a great uh, sort of dynamic picture of experimentation with all the different possibilities and the potentials that there are in being a hominid. Yeah, we also, we all, ha also, all have some of that Neanderthal genes in us, do we not? I mean, mm -hmm. there's some of that in there? Yeah, the Neanderthal uh, uh, genome is, uh, is, is a bit of a revelation. Um, but you've got to remember that uh, species are somewhat uh, leaky uh, vessels, especially uh, newly arrived uh, species uh, such as uh, we and indeed the Neanderthals are. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and it doesn't surprise me if there wasn't a bit of high Pleistocene hanky-panky uh, going on uh, back in the Ice Ages. But what I would say about uh, this, this um, genomic evidence that there may have been some uh, genetic intermingling between, uh, at a very low level, between Neanderthals and, uh, and, and, and Homo sapiens, it didn't have a significant biological effect. It didn't really have an effect on the future trajectory of either species. Homo neanderthalensis continued to be pretty much what it was and eventually became extinct in presumably in competition with Homo sapiens. And Homo sapiens went on to be the creature uh, that it is today. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the audience for a question. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, hi. Um, you mentioned before that um, Neanderthal evolved in Europe uh, and uh, not out of Africa. Can you elaborate on that, that they evolved? in Europe? Yeah, the, in, in general, uh, uh, new species develop in isolation from each other. They may have a common, a common ancestry, they, they may descend from the same population, but in isolation, populations tend to diverge. The uh, evidence now from the fossil record is that uh, the Neanderthal lineage, at least, was in existence in Europe right back to about 600,000 years ago. And that's about the same, uh, the same time as, uh, as molecular biologists infer for the divergence of the uh, Neanderthal group and the, uh, and the uh, modern Homo sapiens uh, group uh, from a common ancestor that presumably evolved uh, uh, in Africa, presumably originally emerged mm. uh, in Africa. You're right, that, that one important factor that is to totally unique to hominids and is paradoxical is the possession of complex culture, mm -hmm. especially as it's expressed in technology. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Yes, obviously uh, culture is, in the strictest sense, is not confined to, uh, to, to, to human beings. Um, uh, chimpanzees, for example, in different parts of Africa pass along. Uh, from one generation to another. They pass along particular ways of, of, of doing things. But no other creature has, has a culture of the depth and the richness uh, that, that human beings have. And human beings have taken culture to a whole new level. And um, we have come, biologically, we've come a very long way in a very short time. And I think it's culture that has allowed us to do that because it's having culture as a buffer against the environment that's allowed different kinds of hominid to spread out over the world and occupy some very marginal uh, in environments um, which they very often have had to, uh, had to abandon. There's been this, this uh, history of fragmenting of the human population which is exactly the uh, circumstances under which you'd expect a lot of evolutionary change to happen. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you have to excuse the simplicity of my question, but it's um, coming from a sixth grade student of mine who asked me once, 
If we evolved from primates, how come there's no evidence of that evolution in primates <clears throat> currently? He didn't say it quite that way. <laughs> he said, how yeah. come monkeys aren't <laughs> behaving more like us? But well, you know, currently we're looking at one, at one slice in time. And um, uh, so there's, there's, a, there's, there's just a sampling of, of, of a particular time point. Um, can I can uh, just interrupt for a second? Just yeah. to, the point of reference is everybody thinks we came from monkeys. Right. Would you clear that up for us? Did we come from monkeys? <laughs> No, we are, we are not descended from monkeys, but monkeys and we are descended from the same common ancestor. Thank you. Just wanted to get okay. that out of the way. Right. I'll let him know. And um, the reason why I think, uh, for example, uh, uh, people say, well, why aren't chimpanzees? If it's such a good idea to get a big brain and to, uh, to, to, to become human-like, why aren't chim chimpanzees doing the same thing? And I think, quite frankly, that the chimpanzees are too already too committed to a particular kind of quadrupedal locomotion um, on the ground uh, to uh, become upright. Our ancestor was a much more generalized ancestor. It seems that upright walking was the original adaptation of the hominid group, of the general hominid group. And um, I suspect that Hominids didn't start walking upright on the ground at a time when the forest cover in Africa was shrinking simply because it was a good idea to do that. I think they probably, the hominid ancestors, probably already moved around in the trees holding their trunks upright so that when they came down to the ground, uh, they would have been most comfortable moving upright. And clearly that's not true for a chimpanzee today. A trim chimpanzee, if it wants to move over the ground, uh, effectively drops to all fours and moves off quadrupedally. Mm -hmm. Let's go to a question in the audience. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, I was reading an article a while ago that was talking about whether humans um, will no longer have to evolve because we, um, we don't need to adjust to nature anymore because we are adjusting nature ourselves. I was wondering what your take on that. Well, I think, first of all, that, uh, that the human ability to, to accommodate to the environment culturally meant we could go to many more different areas of the world than we would otherwise have been able to do, and therefore were, were more subject to fragmentation of our population by environmental change. Uh, that's uh, one thing. Um, and we evolved in this kind of, of sort of unsettled uh, environmental picture. And human beings, for the, or, or human uh, precursors for the virtually all of, uh, of uh, hominid uh, uh, history have been thinly spread over the landscape. They have lived in very small uh, densities, in very small groups, moving over large swaths of uh, territory, which again gives you good uh, circumstances for isolation and evolutionary innovation. Since 10,000 years ago, when our species became sedentary, settled down, first started uh, living in villages and towns and now in urban settings, our, our population has become huge. Our population is 7 billion and, uh, and increasing and we're packed cheek by jowl over the surface of the earth. And these are circumstances in which you could not imagine that significant new genetic innovations could become fixed. A population the size of ours is simply, has simply too much genetic inertia to change. So I think that as long as demographic circumstances remain the same as they are today, Homo sapiens is going nowhere. Well, what is, what is the mechanism that's preventing that exactly? You say we're bunched together, there are too many people together. Why, is the, why, why does that stop evolution? Uh, it's extremely difficult to get the fixation of any uh, genetic novelty arising in a very, very big population. To get the fixation of uh, genetic novelties which arise spontaneously in populations, you really need to have a small, unstable uh, gene pool that can, that can uh, react to this kind of uh, circumstance. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for, for that question. Um, yeah. you, you also write in your book that one of the great uh, modifying or catalysts for, for change has been climate change over the, mm -hmm. over the, yeah. over the, you know, the years. Tell us about that. Yes, indeed. Uh, the, the last uh, several million years have been uh, a time of increasingly unsettled uh, climates. 
uh, that the climate has gotten uh, cold and warm on, on a larger time scale as well as on smaller time scales too, changing the environment. Any hominid group staying in the same place would successively encounter lots and lots of different environments and it's our ability to accommodate to environmental change which is one of the ingredients uh, for our success in, in the world. But you have this effect of, of climate change and, um, and fragmentation of populations. Uh, human populations couldn't remain in one place forever. If an ice sheet comes and covers the place where you're living, you're not gonna be staying there. You're gonna be moving somewhere else uh, more congenial. And it's this effect of uh, um, environmental, uh, climatic and environmental change uh, on populations that really has provided the circumstances under which uh, evolutionary innovations could be fixed in populations. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, ma'am. I was wondering if you could talk about how technology is being applied in your field and maybe how you're using it at the museum to keep things modern, talking about a very old topic. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, well, the, 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 the world is, is, is constantly changing, and this is true of paleoanthropology too. The, uh, the, the, the human fossil record is expanding um, enormously. There are new discoveries, just like the one the gentleman uh, raised of the foot in Ethiopia, and new discoveries being, being uh, announced practically every week. There are new techniques of looking at old data that are becoming available online. So this is a very exciting thing to... Uh, to um, uh, to be involved in, and the problem is is more a problem of keeping up uh, with change rather than thinking of ways to uh, reflect that change. Mm -hmm. Talking with Ian Tattersall, author of Masters of the Planet, The Search for Our Human Origins, um, it, what are some of the big gaps that you think we need to fill in? Or are there gaps in our history that well, I think with, the, with every new fossil that's found, the probability decreases that anybody will come up with a new fossil that will force everybody to rewrite the textbooks. It used to be obligatory. Uh, every time a new fossil, a human fossil, was uh, announced, that uh, the, the, the journalist would say, oh, this is going to... Uh, rewrite the textbooks. Rewrite the textbooks, <laughs> yeah. Um, now uh, we have a really good human fossil record. And um, we, I think, are perceiving the general outlines as this sort of very bushy experimental uh, uh, tree. What's really interesting, though, is, 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 is what we can do with the data we have. A couple of years ago, I would never have been able to imagine that um, uh, people would be in a position to, to, to reconstitute the diet of Neanderthals from the little uh, phytoliths, the, 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 the little grains of, um, of mineral material that are gained from plants that are embedded in the, in the calculus uh, that forms on, on, on Neanderthal teeth. Who would have imagined this? A dentist's nightmare has sort of become a really good source <laughs> of information about what our relatives did and ate in the past. This kind of thing is happening all the time. And um, uh, so I'm not seeing huge gaps to be filled, but what I'm seeing is a story that is being fleshed out enormously and, and in ways that, that are really impossible to anticipate. Do you think people always talk about, you know, as we get better technology, maybe we'll be able to reconstruct the DNA of something, mm -hmm. either, you know, the DNA of a, of, a, of a woolly mammoth or maybe the Neanderthal. Mm -hmm. so, do you think that's going to be possible sometime? Well, uh, hopefully it won't be uh, possible uh, in, uh, in, in, in my lifetime. I think it would raise too many ethical questions. Um, uh, Homo sapiens has had a very bad, uh, very bad um, uh, you know, history uh, in the way in which it's dealt uh, with its uh, close relatives uh, in, um, in, in the fossil and in the living records. I mean, the Neanderthals are gone now. We're working on the chimpanzees and the orangutans and, uh, and the gorillas. And after that, doubtless, it will, it will be the monkeys. Uh, I, I, I mean, losing I, them. All, losing, losing them, yeah. Losing them. Uh, we, yeah. We, we, we really are. And my gosh, if we, if, if we recreated a Neanderthal by some, by some miracle, um, what would we do with it? Um, 
it, it would raise some really extraordinary uh, ethical issues that we haven't even begun to grapple with. Yeah. Question in the audience. The word paleo has been a big word on book covers this past year, the paleo diet, etc. Um, where these books discuss that um, the best way for humans to eat is to eat um, pre-agricultural. In other words, no grains, no rice, go back to the meats, go back mm -hmm. to the protein and, and the fruits and, and the vegetables and the mm -hmm. tubers, et cetera. Um, are you familiar with these books and them discussing how early people ate and how our digestive system evolved and how we should eat? Uh, have you given this any thought? Yeah, if I understand the, uh, the, the, the question uh, uh, correctly, yeah, there's, there's always, you know, there, there's the Neanderthal diet, the caveman diet, uh, the recommendation that you should eat this and that and the other. But what is quite extraordinary about, about uh, our hominid family in general is how generalist we are. Uh, it's very interesting that uh, uh, there are some um, chimpanzee groups that live in, in environments that are not too different from the kind of environment that our very early bipedal relatives lived in. And they live in a very, very different way. Uh, chimpanzees coming out of the forest into tree savanna surroundings eat exactly the same things that their relatives in the forest had. Our precursors coming out of the forest started exploiting a much wider range of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of foodstuffs from very early on, including uh, apparently uh, animal uh, carcasses, at least uh, regionally. And what this, this tells me is, is that we are incredibly generalist in terms of what we eat. So I can't imagine mm. what you would describe a natural um, uh, diet uh, as being. Mm. Um, in, in, in your book, you say that tapeworms mm. can actually tell us something about our past diets. How, how does that work? Yeah, the, 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 <laughs> the tapeworm uh, question is, is a very uh, interesting one. We, and the idea is that we had to, to acquire uh, the tapeworm from somewhere. And it, it, apparently the, uh, the, the tapeworm that infects human beings is related to uh, a carnivore uh, tapeworm, and the, probably the easiest way of, uh, of transmitting uh, tapeworm cysts or whatever would have been for human beings at a very early stage to be feeding on the same carcasses that had been uh, attacked uh, by, by carnivores. Again, pointing towards a propensity for uh, carnivory at an early stage. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is switching gears a little bit. Earlier in your career, you studied lemurs. I did. And um, I like lemurs a lot. But also, <laughs> I've, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you know, several lemurs are endangered with extinction, as are many other primate populations around mm -hmm. the globe. And why is it important for us to be studying living primates uh, to understand our own origins? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's, it's absolutely critical that we know as much as possible about the zoological context we emerged from. And uh, the lady uh, mentioned uh, lemurs, which are primates that live in, uh, in Madagascar, and uh, are our only living model, really, for what our own ancestors were like at around uh, 50 million uh, years ago. And if we're going to flesh out the whole picture of human evolution from the very beginning, from when the, uh, the human, uh, uh, first of all, the primate uh, lineages um, separated from the rest of the mammals, and then uh, the, the human lineage separating from the rest of the uh, primates after that. If we're going to flesh out this story and have a fuller, um, a fuller uh, knowledge of it, it's very, very useful to have uh, living models that we can actually go out and look at in the, in the forest and learn what they do. Mm -hmm. So that um, uh, the lemur is very important for understanding the very early phases of human evolution. Speaking of human evolution, do you find yourself still having to defend the idea of human evolution? I think less often than, uh, than, 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 I, than I might fear. Um, we have had um, 
very, we've, we've had exhibitions on, on mm -hmm. human evolution, looked at by millions of people every year. We have brought original human fossils in uh, to, uh, to display uh, to the general public, to give people an idea of the richness of the record that, that, uh, that we're dealing with. And we have run into really rather little um, mm -hmm. objection from the, from the uh, quarter that you're suggesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's go to the, yes, the mic there. Hi, I'm Beth Ann Fried. Um, back to the food. Um, I've heard a few things recently about um, how cooking has affected our evolution and, and how we, uh, I mean, I work with teeth and I see that our teeth aren't good for mm -hmm. much but cook food. Um, talking about all of these uh, human ancestral cousins, how many of us had fire and and talking about the generalist nature of our diet, um, mm -hmm. which came first, being generalists or, or cooking, and, and how did those come together? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I think the generalist tendency probably came, uh, came first, because we know our ancestors of uh, three and a half, four million years were uh, pr presumably now um, uh, pursuing a generalist, um, um, uh, uh, a generalist diet. Um, the, the cooking argument is a very compelling one, though, but it's entirely circumstantial. We know that about two million years ago, uh, human or hominid brain sizes began to expand. For the first two or three million, maybe four million years of, of uh, hominid evolution, Brain size relative to, uh, to body size had flatlined and remained basically in the, in the ape range. And then suddenly about two million years ago, the curve turns sharply upwards and, and uh, human uh, brain sizes on average start getting bigger very fast. Now, there's a penalty to developing a big brain. We may think we have big brains and so it's got to be a good idea. But actually, a big brain is a very costly uh, organ to have. Our brains are about 2% of our body weight, but they can use up to 25% of all the energy no kidding. that we consume. Yeah. And so there is a cost to be paid, and there is an argument that you could not have started to, uh, to increase brain size without increasing the quality of the diet. And the most obvious way to increase the quality of the diet is actually to use cooking to make the nutrients in the diet much more available than they are in the raw state. And this is a very compelling argument. The only problem is that we have no physical evidence. It's just a, a to theory. It. Yeah, it's a theory about how you can get more. Yeah, more. it's a theory and it's a very beguiling theory and it could even be true. But we don't have the physical evidence that we would want to substantiate it. In fact, there are people who argue that regular cooking uh, uh, came in quite late. We only begin to find campfires routinely as part of uh, human uh, occupation sites about 400,000 years ago. There is one I, in, uh, instance in, from Israel reported of, of, of a succession of hearths dating from about 800,000 years ago, but it's an outlier <laughs> until about 400,000 years ago. So between two million years ago when brains started to expand and 400,000 years ago, there's not a lot of really mm. compelling evidence that people were cooking. Inferentially, it's a great story, uh, but um, we're still looking for the. But in hard science, a the theory is not good enough. You need to have the evidence for it. Well, you know, I mean, in, in science, we, you know, we make a big, uh, a big thing out of uh, science dealing with testable uh, hypotheses and information, mm. um, and yet there's a lot that we believe in science that we can't directly test. All we ask is that it be, be uh, that what we believe is consistent with what we can test. And um, in that, in that um, uh, perspective, the, the circumstantial argument uh, for cooking is still retains a certain amount yeah. of attraction. Yeah, I think we have one, time for one or two questions, yes. Um, actually, I'm a scientist too. Um, I'm a molecular biologist by training, and everything mm -hmm. in my field is next-gen sequencing. You know, DNA sequencing this, DNA sequencing that. And so I wonder to what extent um, in your field you're actually able to recover any DNA. I mean, mm -hmm. fragmented though it may be, that might actually confirm some of the mm -hmm. things that we infer from, you know, the ancestors that we have, uh, you know, the sequences we have in common with, say, yeah. chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. 
Well, the DNA is really important in the, uh, really basically at two, at, at two places. Uh, DNA, as you know, is a very fragile molecule that doesn't conserve uh, very well over long periods of time. And the earliest uh, DNA that anybody has been able to characterize very successfully is not much more than, uh, among hominids anyway, is not much more than about 40,000 years old, which takes us into Neanderthal territory, basically. And it's really, really important uh, to have this new information mm -hmm. on, on the Neanderthal genome uh, so we can begin to judge exactly what is the biological basis for the differences that we can already see and we've known about for a long time in the fossil record in terms of anatomy and in the behavioral record in terms of the kind of archaeological um, uh, 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 artifacts and what have you that uh, these creatures left behind. So it's really important in these later periods. Um, then you have the, uh, the question of using comparative DNA uh, from modern populations of, of, uh, uh, of uh, chimpanzees, orangutans, uh, gorillas, and so on, in order to assess the relative relationships among these groups. And molecular biologists now seem to agree that um, in terms of, uh, of strict phylogeny, at least, we're more closely related to uh, chimpanzees and bonobos than we are to, to, to gorillas, which kind of sort of squeezes the corner of uh, the primates mm -hmm. uh, that um, we inhabit. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, go to our last, last question in the audience here. Yes. This is uh, related to what you, ju you just said. Uh, the phylogeny suggests that we, we evolved from monkeys, right? So it's not incorrect to say that we evolved from monkeys. No, it's really a, a caricature to say we evolved from monkeys. Uh, monkeys are very specialized creatures. They're very derived creatures, just as we are. And we are descended from uh, uh, an ancestor, a common ancestor with the monkeys that was not like a monkey and was not like a human. It was a much more primitive form. So that uh, uh, when we're thinking in terms of modern ancestors of, of, of our ancient ancestry and the ties that bind the primates together, we're thinking of forms not that we can actually go out in nature and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and observe today, but forms that were more primitive than any primates living today. Ian Tattersall, thank you very much for taking time to be with it's us today. It's been a pleasure. Author thank of you. Masters of the Planet, The Search for a Human Origins. You can see the broadcasting from the Milstein Hall of Ocean Life at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. That's the one with the big blue whale hanging from the ceiling. And besides the oceans, one of the main themes of the museum is human origins. Where did, where did we all come from? And it may not be what you think. For example, did you know that Homo sapiens, you and me, first appeared on Earth about 200,000 years ago? Those early humans would have looked almost exactly like us, but they didn't act fully human at that time or think like we do. And even though we are and we were and are the same species. So what happened? What is it that clicked to make us the language-speaking, artistic, world-dominating species we are today? My next guest talks about our beginnings in his new book, Masters of the Planet, The Search for Our Human Origins. Ian Tattersall is also curator of the Spitzer Hall of Human Origins here at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. Welcome back to Science Friday. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Tell us, you know, tell us why I was really shocked that we are still the same Homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. Well, how does, how does that work? Well, species normally have uh, quite a, a substantial longevity. I mean, 200,000 years is not a long time for a species to be in existence. But the earliest evidence we have of people who look just like us uh, comes from sites in Africa that date to about 200,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so what does it mean that they were not fully human like we would think of today? Interestingly enough, the archaeological record that goes along with these early uh, fossils that we uh, can recognize as Homo sapiens um, is pretty much the same as uh, the fossil record that was left by, uh, their, the archaeological record that was left by their contemporaries. 200,000 years ago, there were several different kinds of hominid in the world. And in fact, there had been several different kinds of hominid living simultaneously in the world, really all the way back to the very beginning of the human family, something like seven million years ago. So there were a whole bunch of different 
folks living then. And, there were indeed, yeah. And because we, we kind of think of a linear progression, but that's not how it mm -hmm. happened. No, in fact, the, uh, the human family tree, it turns out, has been very, very bushy. Every couple of years, I've had to redo my family tree of the human uh, uh, group, and um, I think well, I'm up to 23 species now that most people would agree are, are, are recognizable. And three or four of them, at least, have been in, in, in simultaneous occupation in the world at any one time. And so why did one succeed while the other 22 did not? I think it has to do with the fact that at some point in its existence, Homo sapiens became an insuperable uh, uh, competitor. It became very intolerant of, uh, of competition and able to sort of enforce that intolerance. And that involved a major behavioral change. And I think it was a change basically in cognition, a change in the way in which uh, human beings uh, uh, processed information about the world in their minds. Mm -hmm. And what was it? What was the, what was the advantage that they got? I was think it a brain, a brain change different, or what happened? It wasn't simply a matter of brain size. Um, uh, 30,000 years ago, there were Neanderthals still existing in the world, a separate species of, uh, of, uh, of human that came into existence about the same time as Homo sapiens, but separately, we, are, uh, we evolved in Africa, the Neanderthals evolved um, in Europe, and they had brains just as big as ours. Mm -hmm. But they didn't behave in the same way that we behave today, and they behave more like the early uh, Homo sapiens uh, of, that we find uh, in Africa. Mm -hmm. and, how, do you, how do you figure out how um, a human who lived 150,000 years ago mm -hmm. thought or behaved? What, what, what are the tools, or what do you find, or how do you know that? Well, that's the key question, of course. And all we have uh, to judge from, if we can't judge from raw brain size, what we can judge from is the, the archaeological leavings of these early hominids, the, the uh, material evidence they left of their behavior, which is mostly in the form of, uh, of stone artifacts and of uh, uh, campsites and so forth, which give us some idea of the complexity of what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And the Neanderthals were great stone craftsmen. No question about it. But they were, they, they, they were kind of stereotyped in the way in which they, they made tools. They didn't make tools with the kind of creativity and the inventiveness that was characteristics of, uh, of the, uh, the human beings um, who came along uh, later. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, w we've heard so many times that, you know, if a, if a Neanderthal were next to you on the subway, you wouldn't mm -hmm. know the difference. Is that, is that true or is that folk? To, Urban an, to an extent, I think um, I, I would uh, recognize a Neanderthal if it was next to me. Um, <laughs> and you have every day. On this. <laughs> right. But you know, we have considerable uh, experience here in making, in, in, in making reconstructions of ancient hominids, uh, uh, reconstructing how they looked in life mm -hmm. in these, um, uh, these ancient hominids. And it's very true that when you sculpt a face onto a skull, you layer on the, uh, the the, the, uh, the underlying tissues, the, the muscles and so forth, and then the superficial tissues. And you've got this bald creature you know, with no, no hair on its head or on its face um, that looks very distinctive. It looks very, very different from Homo sapiens. Then when you put the wig on, it's much harder to tell, to tell part. So that, um, in fact, uh, we... Uh, we can, we can make this kind of, uh, of reconstruction uh, and um, show it in a way in which it stands out from the rest. But if it's sat next to you on the subway, you might not have uh, too much of an, a notion. Hmm. If you'd like to ask a question, you can step up to the microphones we have there. We'd be very happy to talk with Ian Tattersall, whose uh, new book is Masters of the Planet, The Search for Our Human mm -hmm. Origins. And on the cover, you, you show three different hands. Mm -hmm. What are you trying to illustrate with that three different well, the cover came as a bit of a surprise uh, to me, uh, as, a ma as a matter of fact. I hate it fact. when that happens. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's a very dramatic uh, cover. In fact, what it shows is the hand, that's what you want to have. But as soon as you're striding around on the ground, the uh, big toe starts getting in the way. The, the, the uh, divergent uh, great toe starts getting in the way. And um, this is a very interesting report. Uh, it's as new to me as it is to you. Uh, that just appeared in, um, in, in Nature today. But we were already, I think, getting an impression that at three and a half million years ago, which is the, uh, the, the, the time that this uh, new foot from, uh, 
uh, a site called uh, uh, Waranso in um, Ethiopia is, is from, there was already apparently some, some variation in the uh, actual structure of the feet of the various uh, hominids that were around at the time. And this new find certainly expands this, this variation in a, a very dramatic way. This is sort of what you were saying before about the sorting out of the tree. In other words, mm -hmm. there's different kinds of creatures living all at the same time. Some with flat feet, some with opposable toes. Well, apparently so. If this, uh, if this report is to be taken at, yeah. uh, at, 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 at face value, and they don't have a complete foot, but I think they have fairly good uh, um, uh, evidence on which to base this, uh, this reconstruction of the divergent toe. And yeah, apparently there was a, a hominoid you know, right. around at, uh, at, at, at that time in that environment uh, with uh, this divergent toe. And uh, yeah, it's adding to the complexity of the picture. Uh, when, I was, uh, when I was learning this field uh, too many decades ago, um, we were all taught that it was basically a linear picture, that, that uh, the human, human history was a sort of a, a linear, dogged struggle from primitiveness to, to perfection. And we're learning that this really wasn't the case and that we are the product of a great uh, sort of dynamic picture of experimentation with all the different possibilities and the potentials that there are in being a hominid. Yeah, we also, we all have, also, all have some of that Neanderthal genes in us, do we not? I mean, mm -hmm. there's some of that in there? Yeah, the Neanderthal uh, uh, genome is, uh, is, is a bit of a revelation. And of, uh, I think, a gibbon or a siamang, uh, the hand of a chimpanzee and the hand of uh, uh, a, a modern human. And you can see the hand proportions are very different. And what you have there is, is two higher primates, two, uh, two, 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 two apes um, with very long slender hands that are very good for grasping branches in the trees. And you notice that our own hand is much, much shorter. In fact, it's much broader. The axis of the hand is across rather than along. And uh, that is uh, what makes it possible for us to manipulate items in the precise way in which we can do and make those stone tools that our uh, predecessors made. Uh, yes, we have a question in the audience, sir. Yes, please step up. All right, hello. Um, while I was uh, waiting to enter the recording today, I was actually reading an article in the New York Times about something that I believe was just published today or yesterday in the journal Nature mm -hmm. that a uh, cousin, I suppose you would say, of Lucy that's right downstairs was mm -hmm. discovered in <laughs> Ethiopia. So my question is, I guess the big difference was that Lucy, much like us, has relatively flat feet, whereas this cousin, which seems to have mm -hmm. died out, had the sort of opposable big toe, I guess you would say. And maybe this is not very sophisticated on my part, but if opposable thumbs have been so good to mm -hmm. us, opposable big toes seem like they'd be really useful too. <laughs> so why did uh, mm -hmm. flat feet win out, I guess would be my yeah. main question. Thank you. Oh well, uh, opposable uh, uh, big toes really are very useful uh, depending on what you want to do with them. Um, I, I, I saw a wonderful movie once of an orangutan uh, uh, striking a match using his, using his feet. Something that, that I would have extreme difficulty uh, doing. Um, so if you want to grasp, and if you're moving around on, an, uh, on, on a substrate like you have in the trees and you have limbs to be, to, to be grasped, 